Hello and welcome to our program. Please join me in welcoming on our show today well-known Gandhian and social activist P.V. Rajgopal, who is also the founder of Ikta Parishad and former chairman of the Gandhi Peace Foundation. Thank welcome you. to the program, Rajgopal. Thank you. Thank you. Gandhian, social activist, Gandhi Peace Foundation. You know, these are words when we talk of the Gandhian way, peace, non-violence, social activism. And it's been a beautiful, long, enriching journey for you. How did this start? Back in 1969, when the country was celebrating Gandhi's 100 years of birth, uh, there was a decision to take a train, a mobile train across the country. Okay. Right? This was a mobile exhibition train to help younger generation of Indians to understand how did this young man called Mohan become Mahatma. Right? So that was a long journey for me, right? traveling through the length and breadth of India mm -hmm. with many, many Gandhian leaders like Asan Subbarao and many others. And that is the year when I was challenged by younger generation saying that, okay, Mr. Rajagopal, you can, you can speak about Gandhi, but what have you done in your life to be called a Gandhian? Right? Just because you put up a dress, you don't become a Gandhian. And then towards the end of the train, it was becoming very clear that you can't speak about Gandhi unless you do something. Okay. So Gandhi will not, uh, will not click unless you act. Right? It is not just a theory that you speak. You need to act. And that brought me to Chambal Valley with senior leaders like S. N. Subbarao that we came to Chambal Valley because Chambal Valley, Valley was burning with violence at that point of time killing and counter killing and violence and counter violence you know it's like Chambal Ghati was uh, famous for violence right so we decided to start an ashram and small ashram not because we thought we will be able to to get all these decades to surrender mm -hmm. uh, but to see the younger generation the new generation will not take guns when they have a problem so it's like when you get angry you take gun jump into the ravines and kill and then this is chain of revenge with never ending chain of revenge so luckily we began in 1970 the ashram but in 1972 14th of april we had nearly 560 decades dreaded decades surrendering their arms in front of mahatma gandhi's photograph in our ashram Wow. Right. So this was led by Jay Prakash Narayan. Right. The first round of surrender was by Vinoba Bhave. The second round of surrender was led by Jay Prakash Narayan. So the first round in Madhya Pradesh, second round in Uttar Pradesh, third round in Rajasthan, all put together we were able to get 560 decades to surrender. Okay. So that is where my own understanding of, see, how do you, how do you address the problems of the society? How do you address violence? became deeper right so it was a big learning for me and I think uh, the more I worked in the in the in the field I understood Gandhi is not just a word that you can keep using mm -hmm. again and again but Gandhi is action you see Gandhi is a philosophy to my mind okay. right so how do you get this philosophy articulated not only in words but in action became a big challenge and that took me then to, to the deprived section of society because I thought Gandhi came back to India. Now, uh, 2015 is basically 100 years of Mahatma Gandhi's return to India. Yes, that's right. So this is not just to celebrate Gandhi's return to India. What does it mean? Gandhi came to India to liberate India from poverty, deprivation, slavery, etc., etc. Now for Gandhians, this is a challenge today. Uh, after 100 years, have we really succeeded in liberating this country from poverty, deprivation, exploitation, corruption, injustice and all those. So I think this is a challenging time for us to say we need a second round of uh, freedom struggle. Mm -hmm. Freedom from poverty, freedom from deprivation and marginalization etc. Et so it's a, it's a constant challenge if you take the name of Gandhi, if you, if you keep speaking about non-violence this will come back to you as a challenge again and again and you need to respond. So right. for the last 40, 45 years I was responding to this challenge in a simple way. Uh, 
not a lot with hundreds of young people around me so when we talk uh, rajgopal of violence mm. and i think uh, moving the context of violence just away from physical violence to say poverty is violence deprivation Absolutely. is violence Absolutely. lack of opportunity is also violence. violence and that context and understanding of violence do you think social activism today which is the best way to broaden this concept because it has to be implemented in every walk of life Absolutely. by every person mm. see in fact in my training programs what i'm trying is to help people to understand what is violence to begin with uh, to differentiate between physical violence and structural violence or systemic violence right because the general notion is that we are all concerned when there is a physical violence there is a war in afghanistan we are concerned uh, iraq we are concerned now ukraine we are concerned right but then what is happening around you in the name of caste so many people are deprived women are treated so badly so all this deprivation poverty these are all structural violence and i believe that structural violence is a breeding ground for the kind of direct violence so unless you deal with indirect violence you cannot really start criticizing direct violence so i'm trying to help young people not only in this country but in different parts of the world to understand that it is not only good enough to criticize violence but also to see the direct indirect violence in the society and see how do you deal with indirect violence so that you don't give opportunity for direct violence that is one area of my training the second area of my training is basically to help young people to understand non violence is not not a kind of a passive non violence we are speaking about that way majority of us are non violent we are not killing anybody we are not beating anybody but then we all contribute indirectly right to run a violent system right by our our way of con uh, consumerism uh, what we buy what we don't buy it all decides whether you are promoting violence or not promoting violence so understanding active non violence now how do you become an active non violent actor mm -hmm. is is very important to me and in that process i also help young people to understand anger you know it's like anger generally people say anger is a bad element but to me anger is a good element you know anger is the only time when you get angry you have four times energy than what you have so i believe if you can work with solar energy if you can work with wind energy you can also work with anger energy right see anger is a form of energy where we fail is that we are not able to divert this anger into right. positive action so it's how you use that exactly so mm -hmm. if you have thousands of young people angry because of unemployment because of poverty because of various problems landlessness now can you get this energy rather than diverting this energy into violence how do you divert this energy into non violence so all my actions in the last many years if you notice it properly is basically getting large number of young people helping them to understand the anger and divert that anger into positive energy for not only changing situation at the bottom in your day to day life but also to change policies at the larger level okay and it has really succeeded right and that deeper understanding of violence and non violence is very very important in today's today's india in today's world so when we talk of policy we know that uh, policies are made by people who probably grassroots connect and connect with the youth mm -hmm. is not so much mm -hmm. and yet you have this deep belief that the social fabric and social structure can be changed by young people mm -hmm. how does that work if you look in a country like india you have a large number of young people and mainly rural young people i was working with you know mm -hmm. it's like uh, urban young people have certain opportunities you know they can go to college they have a cricket ground they have a playground but if you look at the rural situation of india where 80% people used to live but the now 65% people are living okay rural youth have no opportunity you know they are they are just there as laborers you know selling labor filling stomach has become the only only options available to these young people so we are trying to create opportunity for rural young people uh, to understand look i mean you don't have to uh, accept this reality as it is right very often young people in rural areas young and old both they because of our karma theory etc they have accepted life as it is there is no chance in this life maybe in the next life 
so you accept injustice you accept poverty you accept uh, exploitation you accept corruption as if this is a given reality mm -hmm. and nothing can be changed and i tell you in my training programs this was designed like you know the first four days are for people to people to build confidence to understand look producing food is something great milking a cow is really great uh, swimming is really great climbing on a tree is really great you know not only using a computer and reading and write writing are great but even other qualities are great so to build this confidence from a position where people were told look you are all stupid in mm -hmm. the villages gamar from that position to oh well what we are doing are also basically important producing food is the greatest thing that one can do working in the field and the next four days are for socio political analysis and in socio political analysis they understand that look i mean uh, uh, poverty is not god given it god didn't make me poor poverty is man made now if it is man made man can change it or woman can change it True. so how do you work in order to change it and then you keep on i mean the the, the whole training program is about 12 days divided into four sections and towards the end you should see every one of them going back so inspired so motivated and they all want to do revolution in a day mm. now my problem is that you need to hold them back otherwise it is going to be very dangerous yes. hundreds of young people getting trained you could unleash going, something exactly yes, going absolutely. back to villages and i tell you this young people went back to village they saw to it that the doctor is coming to the to the hospital on time the teachers are coming to the school on time the ration shops are open on time and the ration is given to the poor people see all this can be guaranteed by the people themselves you don't need uh, delhi or or state capital to control everything give an opportunity to the young people to the women of village train them properly the rural situation can really get transformed now my problem is that when rural people try to transform their situation are we the urban people sensitive to this we very often see this as a negative thing oh these villagers are now standing up and asking for their rights now they are complaining against the politicians they are complaining about the bureaucrats but then we should see this as a positive thing young people village women taking responsibility to transform their own life should be supported so my problem for quite some time was the opposition okay by the educated young people mm -hmm. because they didn't like all this transformation taking place in the villages and that is where i shifted my focus and said look unless you sensitize the urban young people middle class young people to realize that look i have achieved something in my life but people who were not able to achieve people who are left behind should have the right to ask for it they should also get a piece of land they should also get their pension on time they should also get some work so that should not be seen as a negative development we should basically support it so at the moment i am in a process of linking this rural energy with urban energy okay. so that we can all work together in order to transform our society our country because after 60, 67 years of freedom we should realize that we have indeed really achieved what we wanted to achieve in terms of freedom for everyone Right. some people have got freedom some people have climbed up but people who climbed out of the well has the responsibility to look back and say now come on there are people behind Absolutely. we need to pull them out yes. rather than climbing on their shoulder and climbing up and up but you need the responsibility you have the responsibility to look back and help others so that is what i think the youth energy of this country can really transform this country right if we really work with them in a systematic way right mm -hmm. and i think that's very beautiful so you say freedom for every put a space and do one mm -hmm. is where it becomes a self mm -hmm. but it's actually freedom for everyone yeah, right. not that's every true. one i don't know and we get limited <laughs> by that one that's true that's true so that's when true. we see uh, individual strengths and we also know that individual strengths when they come together collective gain is much more mm -hmm. than one would have gained individually but i think the barriers you're breaking are the barriers of fear so when two people who are different mm -hmm. two communities who are different two situations urban and rural when they're different i think difference makes us fear mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. more accepting right, right. and inclusive absolutely do you know that is what happened to the adivasis look at the way we treat adivasis you know why the adivasi area became so violent 
-hmm. It's basically we have failed in terms of delivery of justice right. to the Adivasi communities, you know. We have a notion that the Adivasis are backward and the Adivasis are in the jungle, etc. Or they're violent. Actually, traditionally, they're very peaceful people. Yeah, exactly. So when I started working with them, I realized Adivasis can be our gurus, right? In fact, uh, simplicity, see, consume, people who are in the consumerist world will believe that people who are simple, mm -hmm. who don't consume too much, are backward. Yes. Basically, not consuming cannot be seen as backward. They are, they are the forward. <laughs> I think it's so much more responsible. Exactly, exactly. So when we will consume every bit of resources in the world, the, the, the minerals, the, the oil, probably we will have to go back to the Adivasis to understand how do you live simple. True. Right? So the simplicity, what Gandhi always spoke about, simplicity should be seen as a virtue, not as people who are very, very backward and stupid, etc. So if we can start respecting Adivasis for their way of life. And understanding the balance between need and greed. Exactly, exactly. And also your closeness to nature. True. Right? I mean, we are all detached from nature and they are very close to nature. They know how to respect nature. They know how to live with nature. And that should not be seen as something backward. So through my work in Adivasi area, I understood that our notion of uh, villagers, farmers, Adivasis uh, are very, very, very wrongly constructed. In the sense, you know, mm -hmm. farmers are selling their land because we said, oh, what is in, what is in land? Oh, who would like to marry the daughter of a farmer? You know, if you, if you start speaking that language, then farmers will say, look, we need to give up farming and get to the city somehow. So sell the land, uh, get to the cities as early as possible. I will not like to say my father is a farmer, then the farmer has mm -hmm. no value. So same thing happened with village you know the very word gawar is always used as if they're all backward people living in the villages right so the village the farmer the adivasis the moment we start giving value and respect to people who are working physically who are living closer to nature the situation is going to change otherwise uh, we are creating a very dangerous situation i very often feel if everybody will stop producing food, what will happen to the country? He will be completely dependent on other countries for food and that is the beginning of slavery. So I think we are, and that is the area where I am a bit critical of the modern education. Okay. Right, because uh, modern education is basically helping people to be very competitive and also to understand, look, I mean, uh, you need to you need to win and you need to move up you know all this notion of winning and moving up and defeating and uh, becoming first you know this in this notion you very often have this feeling that okay i need to i need to succeed in terms of making money you know because if you have a lot of money you have respect and respect is that everybody is looking for if i have a big car i have respect so in this process you can't make all that like you said i mean this is the struggle between greed and need. So a lot of people become greedy because you want to make bigger car and bigger houses and a lot of money, bank balance and credit card in your card in your pocket. Mm -hmm. So you you create poverty and problems for millions of people because you need to exploit people to create that kind of a wealth. So I think modern educated people they understand if they understand, look, success cannot be uh, something that I, I, I try to achieve alone. This is the success of a nation, right? Millions of people poor, deprived, exploited. I cannot be proud of this country. If I need to be proud of this country as an Indian, I need to tell the world, look, there is nobody exploited in, in my country. There is no deprivation in my country. There is no injustice in my country. Then I am a proud Indian. So what we call the nationalism is not just saying that we have so many big companies so we are very powerful, but to say there is no exploitation, there is no injustice, there is no deprivation, there is no discrimination, etc., etc., and that is missing in the in the mind of educated people because we tend to believe that we are a superpower and uh, incredible India and shining India, etc., etc., without really understanding you can't shine, you can't be incredible, you can't be great unless you deal with problems of that kind, so many million people, 
I mean, see how many people live on the railway track, how many people are on the roadside under a plastic sheet, so many people, so many children begging and child labor and bonded labor. So our notion of pride need to be re-articulated. Right. And that need to come through an educational process. So you can't just say you should be an engineer and doctor and years, etc. without telling them what does it mean? What does it mean that I am proud of my country? There's a lot of work that need to be done in the educational field. Right. Yeah. So do you see there is a conflict between how we see growth and development and sustainability and equity? I do. I think uh, the, the, the see, world all over. I mean, mm. It's not just an Indian problem. I, as, I, as I travel in uh, European countries nowadays, people ask me this question. Uh, like in France and England, take the example that uh, France and England, increasing level of poverty, increasing level of unemployment. So people keep asking me, Mr. Rajagopal, you have a Gandhian philosophy. You had a leader like Gandhi. Okay, you have Bhagavan Buddha, you have Mahavir Swami, you have Vivekananda, you have Bhagavan, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Mm -hmm. We had nothing of this kind. Mm -hmm. right? Why are you making the same stupidity that we made? See, today we understand in the name of development, we exploited the entire world because we had colonies to exploit. So it was easy for us to exploit and bring money and then run the state the way we wanted to run. But today we realize that there is so much poverty and problems because this development model has no future. Right? This is not the kind of development that will create happiness for everyone. So they are now sending their representatives to Bhutan to see what is this happiness index all about. Right, you know? right. So if a small nation called Bhutan can understand happiness is the, should be the result of development, then I think it is time for India also to learn that just because some people make a lot of money, it doesn't become developed. It is not the size of the road, size of the building and the size of the airport that will decide development. Development is also an internal process. See, externally, materially, you may be developed. Mm -hmm. But what is happening to the human mind and heart? Why are we so insensitive? Because, you see, in 2011, when I traveled across the country, covering a distance of 80,000 kilometers, covering 350 districts, I was shocked by the level of insensitivity in this country. You know, so much of displacement, so much of poverty, and the people running the system has no concern, right? You can transfer large tract of land to a company for mining by displacing Adivasis without even caring where are they going to go, where are they going to live tomorrow. And that's extreme violence. Extreme violence. Lack of concern and Absolutely. not being involved is violence. Absolutely. So I think when the world is recognizing that this development has no future, this kind of development has right. no future. Development will mean not only an external journey where you, you accumulate material wealth, mm -hmm. but also an internal journey. And I think that is where Gandhi is relevant to me. Gandhi said, look, I mean, the, the, the civilization is all about how you can harmonize what you say and what you do. Isn't it? Wonderful. So how, yes. how, can, how can you just keep speaking things and do exactly the opposite? We Indians are becoming number one in doing that. You know, it's like we can say anything that we want. We can promise anything we want. But in our action, we are just the opposite. Right. So I think education should take people out of that. Right. Education should be able to transform people from this contradiction, that you can't continue to play this contradiction and believe that nobody will take note of it. I think that's very beautifully put, Rajagopal, mm. to say how do we see accountability. Mm. So we are seeing national accountability, global accountability, yeah. my state level accountability. What about my individual accountability? accountability. Can Absolutely. I just do it without asking myself questions? Well, I'm accountable for taking a short break. Exactly. We're <laughs> going to take a break. But we'll come back and learn more about your work with young people and also the Andolan the Satyagraha, the mass movement, and how peace has a place in such movements. But right now, we take a short break. Stay with us. Welcome back. We're still in conversation with well-known social activist and Gandhian, P.V. Rajgopal. 
Rajgopal, you've really used Padhyatra, mm. mass movement, grassroots support for actually making a statement. How powerful has it really been in terms of translating into action? See, all my life, you know, it's like uh, when I began as a social worker, I was always looking for various possibilities mm -hmm. uh, that can be introduced as part of my action. Right? Okay. So when I looked at poor people, I thought, what are the poor people uh, capable of? Right? Rather than criticizing what they are not capable of, I was trying to see what are they capable of? What can they can do? And I tell you, the 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 my uh, my my findings were very very interesting. Mm -hmm. Now I found four elements of action. Right? What is it? Uh, the first element was that people can walk, right? Because they walk kilometers to get their water. They walk kilometers to get their firewood. Walking is something very common. They will not complain about walking. Come on, that is an element that is a problem for them because they have to walk kilometers and kilometers to find water and firewood. But then that is, the problem can be converted into a possibility. So I was creating a possibility basket. Wonderful. Right? That is okay. one. Mm -hmm. Second one, I, when I ask people, they say, look, well, we don't have, um, in spite of all the work we do, we get only one meal a day. I said, okay, people have the capacity to survive with one meal a day. So if they have to get into an action with one meal a day, they can survive, which a middle class person can't do, True. but the poor people can. So this difficulty of surviving with one meal a day was brought into the possibility basket. Then they will say, look, well, we have just one room, so five of us need to sleep in the same room. So I said, okay, even in great difficult situations, they can sleep. So sleeping on the national highway will not be a problem, right? So that bro was brought into a possibility. Then they will say, look, we have to work in the sun. Uh, throughout the day, we are in the sun, so hot sun. So heat is not a problem for them. So walking kilometers in hot sun, sleeping on the national highway, eating one meal a day, this is something that I understood by working with the people, right? So I brought these problems into the possibility basket. And when I organized this long march, this is none of my invention. <laughs> this is what they do every day. Right. But then what was the power behind is that when one person does it, this is not so powerful. Thousands of people doing it together. So this group action became the very powerful tool. And of course, we have this heritage of Mahatma Gandhi walking for making salt, Vinobaji walking for land, you know. Walking was always in this country, right? And this is something which old and young can do. This is something women and men can do. This is something even children can do. So walking became a statement. So okay. we are going to walk because we have problems. We want to be nonviolent. Walking is the most nonviolent action that we can do. The second thing that we brought to us, look, we learned it from Gandhi. Unless you suffer the idea of sacrifice, you know, this is a statement. Look, we will suffer in order to change your attitude. So thousands of us walking in the hot sun, eating one meal a day, sleeping on the road. If it doesn't change you, what else will change you? So it was basically an appeal to the state saying that, look, we want to use this nonviolent tool very powerfully to change your way of thinking, change your heart, right? And I, we are going to do it in, in a very powerful way in, even in coming years. So that is one powerful action we introduced for changing the situation of the poor people, using their strength, at the same time appealing to the people who are decision makers and, and in power. The second interesting part that, that we used in our struggle was bringing f four components together. We call it the power of the poor. Okay. Right? See, very often we feel poor people are very powerless. But I think they may be powerless in terms of economy. Socially, spiritually, culturally, they are very rich. So don't look at poor people as poor. Look at them as poor economically, but see the power of the poor. So we brought power of the poor as an element. Then we said, okay, power of the young. Young mm -hmm. people have a lot of power, bring that into the basket. Then power of solidarity. If one group will act, 
this is powerless but then if hundreds and thousands of people are writing to the prime minister appealing to the government then it is very powerful solidarity actions are very powerful and finally power of non violence so power of the poor power of young power of solidarity and power of non violence and that also came so this is not just social work this is basically a science you know okay. how do you develop the science of social mobilization how do you how do you develop the science of uh, poor people's action as a powerful statement and i think in the, in the last 10 15 years we were acting it out again and again in order to mobilize people on one side we need to help people to understand the power of their own action on the other side this power was used uh, as a statement to help the state to change their policies so it's a lot of work at the ground level and now uh, people from many countries are coming to india to learn this because they they understand this is a real powerful tool right and then uh, putting all that together right is is basically it's a science so many people are learning from it how can people's power and non violent power of non violence come together for transforming the world now what is happening people's power is taking the shape of violence you see, when you look at the middle east and other places what you see or even the incident in france recently mm -hmm. young people out of frustration are using violence we have the responsibility to reach out to the younger generation of this country younger generation of the world and say look your energy can be used non violently to change the world why are you getting into violence and that is what we were able to introduce right and that was accepted very well by different absolutely people, yeah. so when you have these large groups of people and they are across all uh, age groups how do you ensure that violence as a core value is not followed and non violence is the overarching umbrella is of non violence because mm. all kinds of people come in some with training mm. and some totally new to this culture right right mm. i think uh, my my experience in chambal valley taught me a lot of things you know mm -hmm. it's like uh, how could people with a gun come and surrender so that is what i understood dialogue can be a very very powerful uh, instrument you know it's like so helping young people to talk you know making people to believe that ultimately after all the fight you need to talk when you need to begin to talk but my problem is it is not only important that people need to talk the state also need to learn to talk absolutely so it is not sending the police that is going to solve the problem very often we have a feeling that you see in a in a country like india take the example you have a ministry for defense mm -hmm. you have a ministry for police why there is no ministry for peace and non violence why you have no budget for peace and non violence so we tend to believe that we don't have to do anything for peace and non violence it will automatically come it can't come automatically because the environment doesn't allow it to allow come out to come yeah right so take the example from different countries like in georgia mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, in the in the south caucasus uh, uh, area georgia i found the government has initiated a ministry called peace and reconciliation right uh, uh in bhutan they have decided that the entire agenda should be happiness in norway you know how how did they address crime uh they decided to request all the journalists to stop crime reporting now every newspaper has a crime reporter right a war reporter there is no peace reporter so they were requesting the journalists to write about peace and peace initiative rather than sensational news that will help people to understand oh how crime can be committed so Absolutely. we need to really the state need to move i uh, think initially you're very right because mm. initially crime used mm. to be an aberration mm. then crime became the kind of rule mm. and everybody started focusing on the crime yeah, right, right and peace became an aberration absolutely so absolutely. i think that that's the yeah, yeah. and i think advocacy publicity what people see is what they tend to believe, believe also right. so some way we encourage the wrong stereotypes exactly, like exactly. that so we need to do a lot of work in terms of promoting peace and young people generally what i believe that if you can help them to understand non violence they are willing to take it they are willing to act out non violently their anger will not be always expressed violently but then there should be lot more possibility for them to understand mm -hmm. this art of non violence right. we need to teach them right 
So when we talk of uh, the process of peace, it's a slow one. Mm. Change is a painfully slow process. Mm. Young people today want immediate results. How do you say that there is a balance between how long people will wait? Because dialogue is so critical. But dialogue always doesn't happen. Mm. And change can come through dialogue. So how do you get different stakeholders to understand that patience is understood, but patience is also a very, very rare commodity? Right. So look at India. Right. Now, we have many, many groups which are marginalized in this country. You have 20 percentage of our population are Dalits without land. 8 percentage of our population are Adivasis who are getting displaced almost every day in the name of development, so-called development. Okay. Fisher folks are 2 percent and 11 percent are nomads. So all of them put together are about uh, 40, 41 percentage of people, right? 20 percent Dalits and 8 percent Adivasis, 11 percentage of nomads and 2 percentage of fisher folks. And for the last 67 years, these people were silently, non-violently, occasional sporadic violence are there, but then these people were occasionally, uh, very systematically asking for justice. See, that is where I start believing in the power of non-violence because there were hundreds of opportunities for these people to be violent. Mm -hmm. But if you look at various struggles, whether it is struggles of fisher folks, nomads or Hadivasis or Dalits, majority of the struggles are all non-violent struggles. So in spite of not getting justice, they have this courage to continue to struggle non-violently. And it is our responsibility to not to keep people struggling for years and years for a piece of land, for a ration card, for justice. So our capacity to advance from the other end, okay. right? Justice is should not be such a rare commodity that you struggle for 67 years to get a small piece of land to put up a shed to call your own house or get a piece of land in the in the in the tribal area which was your forefathers land taken by the forest department you want to get it back so i think rather than showing that justice is a rare commodity in this country you continue to struggle and we will continue to send the police and force against you it is very important that when you find majority of our people struggling uh, non-violently respond to it non-violently through a dialogue process and solve their problem and that is where we are failing that after 67 years if you don't find justice you tend to believe or you are made to believe mm -hmm. all this non-violence will not work right why create that situation why even create a situation where people are told or oh, non-violence will work it must have worked with Gandhi not not in today's India so I want people to understand Nonviolence is working, still working. We have a role if we want to make it work for a very long period. And that will be an inspiration for many other countries. I tell you, in many other countries, people are taking lessons from India. And they feel we have a lot to learn from here in terms of nonviolence. We have a responsibility to prove that nonviolence will work. And through nonviolent struggles and nonviolent methods, justice can be provided to millions of our countrymen. Right. And that is where. Uh, India is not waking up. That is my problem. Mm -hmm. Why, while India is making up, waking up for everything else in terms of uh, advancing its economy, advancing its technology, advancing its scientific achievements, etc., why are we not advancing in terms of proving non-violence will work? If it is working in India, it can work everywhere else. So we have this responsibility to prove again and again. Oh, look at this country where non-violence is working. Why can't it work in Russia? Why can't it work in America? It can work everywhere if it can work in India. Right. So I think we should make that as a very important agenda and make it work at every level. So those who are struggling, rather than rather than oppressing them, or rather than using force and police to suppress them, we have the responsibility to see that they succeed. Right. And their success will be a story for the world at large. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. In fact, I think the onus of those who have power mm. is mm. to empower. Absolutely. See, power has to move to exactly. empower. Exactly. And I think this exactly. links back to your question on education mm. to say that somewhere young people, uh, are we helping them understand mm. that the decisions and the choices they make and are going to make are not in isolation. Mm. We're all linked at mm. the hip. Right. And your individual success or sustainability links to the success of the other. Ah, absolutely. 
Absolutely. That is where this philosophy of Sarvodaya comes in, you know. Right. When Gandhi said Sarvodaya, people thought it is a very simple thing. You know, well-being of minority is an old theory. Mm -hmm. Well-being of majority is also an old theory. Well-being of all is the most radical theory I have, I have understood in the world, you know. And who can practice it? India should practice it because this theory emerged in this country. The countries where capitalism emerged, they have practiced it. The countries where communism emerged, they have practiced it. But then India where this theory of, theory of Sarvodaya emerged, right. we have the responsibility to practice it. And I think even Gandhi's statement, you know, whenever you contemplate an action, Think of the poorest and weakest. Yeah. Or take Vivekananda. Vivekananda said, look, I mean, as long as there is even a stray dog hungry, my spirituality is to find food for that hungry dog. You know? So let us, let us respond to this, this beautiful, beautiful leadership that we got in the past and not get just carried away mm -hmm. by this temporary material wealth and accumulating wealth and showing the world that how, how rich we are, etc. But to carry those values for which Gandhi stood, Vivekananda stood, Bhagavan Buddha stood, Mahavir stood, you know. We have a heritage of richness and I, I will be very happy to see that richness being articulated in our day-to-day -day life, not only in terms of words but in action. Then India will be a beautiful country, India will be a perfect country which, which will give inspiration to millions and millions of people across the globe. I'm going to go in for another short break. When we come back, we will want to understand how do you see the demographic dividend panning out for the country and what do we really need to take stock of initially as people who work with young people to see that it becomes a dividend and not a liability and a little more about the value we place on work. Are we as a society placing the wrong value or a higher value on things which are not sustainable and a very, very low value on that we should really cherish. Mm. But right now, another break. Dariba Diaries mein jamegi mehfil aur kano mein ras ghulenge. Wah! Par kise pata tha? Maut bhi rakte hai sangeet ka shauk. Mauka hai vartaat pe hume do gawaan mele to hai. Un mein se ek anda hai aur ek behra. Kya badnaam hote sangeet ko? Dubara izzat dila paayenge Mirza Janawaz. Dariba Diaries, Shukravar Rath 9 Baje, DD National Par, Desh Ka Apna Channel. Welcome back. We are still in conversation with well-known Gandhian and social activist P.V. Rajagopal. Rajagopal, you know we talk of value, we talk of worth and we also say that certain work is not looked up to and that it's a kind of a caste system in our heads mm -hmm. and based on the value society places we automatically start moving in that direction. And I think that's where when we get disconnected, maybe not only with our roots, but also that which roots us. And I think that's the difference. Mm -hmm. So how do we socially become more emancipated in saying we need to give value to the right things so that we can move in that direction? Mm -hmm. See, when I was a student, I was part of a Naithalimu school. Okay. Know? And Naithalimu was a concept that Gandhiji introduced where he said, look, what is important is not textbook-centered, classroom-centered education. What is important is work-centered, value-centered education. That's what he said, you know. So he had, had a concept of, he wanted to break away from the old educational system to a new educational system. That is why it was called Nai Talim, mm -hmm. New Talim. Nai Talim. Nai Talim, mm -hmm. right. And uh, as school kids, I remember that, you know, we were supposed to produce enough for our own food. You need to work in the agriculture field and learn your mathematics and science in the field, right? You are not running it in the classroom. You need to spin your own cloth, right? We are all spinning for one hour, weaving our cloth. You make your own soap. So this value for manual labor yes, for was working part with of our hands. education, yeah. working with your own hand, you know. Uh, so slowly what happened, you know, we, uh, we started giving more importance to this intellectual capacity and very little value to the work that you do by hands and that has brought about a great problem for this country now right why people are selling land is because they think working on the land is no more respected uh, why people 
are all looking for white collar job because they feel the other kind of works are not respected. So everybody want to be respected. So they all move out of this work. So the social value the social plays value. That. So okay. I think this is this is a dangerous trend. And um, in some states, when I travel through a state like Kerala, I find it is is dangerous. You unless you have people coming from Bihar and. Uh, uh, West Bengal, there are no people to do manual labor. Okay. Now they are they're all into intellectual work and nobody wants to do manual labor. The ultimate result will be that we will, we will one, we will miss all technical skills that are in the villages. You know, the, the carpenter, the blacksmith, blacksmith, uh, the porter, all kinds of skills are being destroyed. And market is taking complete control okay. over everything. Every every product has to be in the marketplace produced by big companies. So I often refer to what Gandhi said, you know, what is important is not mass production, but production by masses. Mm. See, this capacity that everyone should have enough to do and contribute to the, the productive process rather than being just a consumer because you get money somewhere without even knowing wh where are you getting this money, but you can buy in the market. So this, this market-centric approach has really created a lot of problem for us. I think uh, that is where we need, to, we need to get back to understand the value, value of work. And in my programs, uh, why in the training programs, we introduce the manual labor as a concept. Right. All religious prayer as a concept. In a country like India, where you have four religions born here and many religions came, we should celebrate this diversity of religions in this country. Similarly, uh, we have so much manpower. Uh, we can produce whatever we want. We don't have to just depend on uh, products that are brought from outside. So this capacity to work by hand, the capacity to respect everybody, these are all values which we need to bring back. And I try to do that through our training programs. But in, see, our training programs are so limited compared to the size of the country right. and uh, and the number of people. So I believe helping young people to understand the value of work is, is, is very, very important. Ultimately, what is going to happen? We will, we will slowly sell away our land because producing food is no more respected. And there's a huge lobby, okay, put it this way. Mm -hmm. There's a huge lobby which is trying to educate everybody that look, uh, working in the field is a useless thing. So this is basically to help people to sell their land. And there are people waiting to buy the land. The land is only a commodity. So we have moved away from this concept of Mother Earth yes. to Earth as a community, commodity. And this is a big change, you know. Uh, the term that people use in the villages is Dharti Mata. Mm. No Dharti Mata, Ganga Maya, Go Maya. Go Mata, Saraswati Mata, Lakshmi Mata, everything is mother, right? This concept of mother. So it's the relationship. Exactly. Mm. So this is a child-mother relationship. And now slowly we have abused everything. We have abused Ganga Mata, we have abused Go Mata, we have abused Saraswati Mata, we have abused Lakshmi Mata, we have abused Dharti Mata. Right. So everything that you call Mata, this is almost like, you know, your attitude to women, at, women in general. Right? So, we need to come back to respect our mother, uh, respect uh, women, and uh, when we read stories in Delhi, uh, rape and abuse, and we believe that we, have, we are really moving very fast in terms right. of... Because everything uh, becomes commodified, commodi commodified, commodified uh, disposable, yeah. exactly, exactly. use and throw, exactly. including people, including exactly. relationships. Exactly. And I think somewhere to understand that or the ma associated with the word mm. is nothing to do with religion, mm. but with no. relationship. Absolutely. And Absolutely. the respect comes from the relationship. Yeah, 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 yeah. So talking again, you're very deeply involved with land reforms. Mm. And uh, in the urban culture, land reforms is, is a term. But for the grassroots level, it's bhumi. bhumi. The bhumi, uh, so bhumi nourishes. Mm. But in the urban context, land reforms is about a property. Mm. And I think this gap Mm -hmm. is a non-sustainable one. Yes, absolutely. 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 See, this understanding that, see, land is not just a piece of land. It is identity, dignity, and security. Right? If I have a piece of land, I have an identity in my village. I have an address. Right? If I have a piece of land, 
I can bail out myself from the from the police station because that is a security. Right. Right. It is also dignity. My my child get married because I have an address and I have a piece of land. So this is not just a commodity. This is this is a lot more than that. You know. So this this notion is not understood generally. The modern world has made land just uh, a kind of a commodity to sell and buy and speculate. You know, mm. you you buy land not because you need land. Because you know, in ten years' time, there will be an airport coming up, so I can sell the land, make more money. I will be in America. I don't. I'm earning one lakh rupee a month or two lakhs rupees a month, but still, I will have land here because I think in long term I can sell the land and make more money. This understanding. You see, my own feeling is that you know, Indians need to wake up this reality. Uh, everyone need an opportunity to to progress in life. So people who have other opportunities should give land to those who are completely dependent on land right and they love land they produce food on land so people who are living in the cities and are employed should not be investing in land and buying up land by depriving them from their land and resources so the natural resources like vinoba said he said look aasman sabka hai hawa sabka hai pani sabka hai to dharti bhi sabka hai right so the land belongs to everybody so everyone should have uh, the 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 possibility to to be part of the land uh, be a producer on the land and and maintain their family by using the land so by accumulating land by by keeping land as land bank by some people uh, many are deprived i think in a, in a country like india where 65% people are still in rural areas unless we have a very pro poor very progressive land redistribution agenda okay i don't think we are able to we will be able to fight poverty see ultimately we need to fight poverty and fighting poverty will become possible only by sharing resources and sharing resources will mean sharing the land and natural resources that are that are available to millions of people to make a living true so we have somehow created a situation whereby we the people who are powerful will have all the jobs all the business and also all the land it's like right? another <laughs> it's like another king on an expedition to yeah. conquer yeah conquer you right? just you know you're conquering resources every, every all resources. right so quickly before we say thank you you have something planned which is across borders yes how do you get mass movement moving across borders quickly yeah this is us. this is a program called jai jagat 2020 you know jay jagat is a concept given by vinoba he said look i mean don't think in terms of your borders these are all artificial borders mm -hmm. uh, the god has created this world okay so this world is one you survive together if you survive you sing together if you if you don't do it properly so this jay jagat 2020 is a concept that uh, many people in different parts of the world are now taking forward so we are going to train 100000 and we are going to organize a march of 100000 people okay 1 million people mm -hmm. uh, 1 million people in 2020 and this march is going to be in different parts of the world people will march in their own country but at the same time there will be one march from rajghat gandhi samadhi okay to geneva the capital of united nation right okay. so this is basically to say look after so many years let us remember gandhi not only remember gandhi on 2nd of october mm -hmm. remember gandhi in terms of what he said well number one he spoke about a need based development not greed based development he said there is enough for everyone's need and not enough for anybody's greed and he said think of the poorest and weakest when you contemplate an action he also said what is important is mass a production by masses not mass production etc get back to what gandhi said and tune the development model of the world that will be all inclusive not just making some people billionaires and, <laughs> and rich mm -hmm. but giving the resources to everyone to make a happy world right so jai jagat campaign will be all about, all about a a development model based on ethics and justice wonderful that will make the world a happier place for everyone without doubt because i think somewhere it's about how we see the individual as a larger whole yeah all together separate yet all one and all linked one. 
So thank you so much for thank helping you. us push our boundaries and bringing us all together on this. Thank you so much for your time and wish you all the best, Rajkopal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.